common talking point on the right is that people without children have no skin in the game and as such should not occupy positions of power. There have been many high profile childless leaders in recent years and this has attracted a great deal of criticism. It's argued that because they don't have children themselves, they have no impulse to improve or preserve the positive features of the society that they govern, and that they have no reason to avert the climate catastrophe. The argument runs, why would they care about the fallout from climate change when they will have no direct descendants? Indeed, this argument is extended to include childless voters. The childless, it's argued, don't care about the future, only about getting more handouts, cheaper commodities, and a general support for every myopic policy going. The fascination with the imagined career woman who puts off children only to become a broken spinster, or the PUA weirdo who says nothing matters because he'll be dead by the time the problems appear, are foreshadowed by other thinkers. Ayn Rand, incidentally, managed to combine the broken spinster and the PUA archetype together. The childless writer, and unironically the Findom mistress of ex-fed chair Alan Greenspan, infamously said, the world dies with me. And the argument runs that the childless voter holds a weaker form of this solipsism. But while having children does change parents' political and social attitudes, it doesn't change their attitudes to the future. The intergenerational concern that parents feel after having children is not necessarily a concern that extends beyond the immediate life cycle of the parents and their children. So just how does having children change social attitudes? Studies conducted in both Australia and the United States find that the more traditional roles assumed by men and women after becoming parents leads them to embrace more traditional gender roles. In the Australian case, for example, the transition to parenthood was associated with, quote, both men and women becoming more likely to support mothering as women's most important role in life. Men also became more conservative after having children, spending less time in the house and more time working. So having children reinforces traditional gendered roles. Despite the increasing flexibility in apparent liberalisation of masculine gender roles and the drive to root out, quote, toxic masculinity, many men revert to traditional roles after becoming fathers. The government in Sweden, for example, has struggled to persuade men to take advantage of paternity leave policies. The fathers instead are choosing to retreat into the quote provider role. Similarly, a sociological study in England showed that while men expressed intentions to become more involved fathers before having children, they reverted to more traditional roles after they actually became fathers. Young childless men may make overtures to becoming liberal dads or Adrians who will change nappies and do the homework with the children and tweet that Boris Johnson is thick. But then reality eventually bites and they retrench into traditional roles as soon as they leave the hospital. This phenomenon of parents shifting to a more conservative outlook is truly independent of any selection effects. Clearly, the more conservative parents will have children but the evidence for parents becoming more conservative after childbirth is rooted in before and after panel data, capturing the change in the values and not the initial biases. Childless people do not experience this common shift towards conservatism and the common shift towards reinforcement of traditional roles. This first point can help to explain why many women in high-powered positions in non-traditional gender roles do not have children. There is doubtless a desire for children, but by not pairing off and settling down early, the odds of landing a husband fall precipitously. US Census Bureau data shows that at age 28, there are four college-educated single men for every three college-educated single women. A decade later, 
the situation has radically changed. At 38, 10 years after, there is one man for every three women. Women are forced to make a choice between a high risk strategy and a low risk strategy, whether to postpone child rearing in order to focus on a career, drastically reducing the chances of eventually child rearing, or settling down early and sacrificing high end earning potential. To clarify how severe that risk is, a study conducted by Sylvia Ann Hewlett from Harvard Business Review revealed that 89% of young high-achieving women believe that they will be able to get pregnant deep into their 40s. But sadly, new reproductive technologies have not solved fertility problems for older women. The research shows that only 3-5% to of women who attempt in vitro fertilization in their 40s actually succeed in bearing a child. If infertility becomes a problem for high-earning women in their 30s, then the chances of having children is tragically slim. Egg freezing and IVF is not the panacea that it is sometimes made out to be. So for those women who have children earlier in life, they will divert resources away from their career and conform to a more typical gender role. States with more generous parental leave also make it more difficult for parents to return to the labour market. By leaving the job market for most of the year, human capital depreciation, which is the accumulation of education and experience, combined with potential discrimination, leads to lower probability of returning to your pre-pregnancy firm. Having a child lowers your chance of employment and lowers your returning wage. Whether this is due to missing out on skills growth, human capital depreciation and lower productivity, or whether this is discriminatory is debated in the literature. There are economic disincentives to return to the labour market, which reinforce gender roles, but also political and cultural ones. This all seems to suggest that the parents become more conservative because they now have skin in the social game. Just as people become more conservative after they buy a home, as the Labour government discovered in the 1951 election, they become more conservative too after having a child. The former gives them a greater stake in the economy, and the latter a greater stake in the, quote, future. But to what extent is the latter really the case? What else does having children do to the parents' social attitudes and economic outlook? Well, parents' attitudes change, but only in the service of their children. This shifts of attitudes into demanding greater intergenerational spending, more money spent on their children, is not really an investment in the future, as much as it is an immediate spending on their own children. There is nothing new about temporality here only the multiplication of generations. If the average age of being a parent is around now 30 years old, and life expectancy is around 80, there is an overlap of 50 years between the child and the parent. The utility of giving your children a better life is realised for the parent within their own lifetime. Indeed, it's often said that the greatest satisfaction of a parent is to become a grandparent because it shows the success of their children and by extension, of course, themselves. So when mothers demand increases in welfare spending for their children and more money on education, what time scale are we really considering? It is conceivable and occasionally the case that children will have living great-grandparents, that four generations will coexist within the same time period. So what do we mean here by the future? The future is not a future beyond the experience of the parent. It's not a future beyond the experience of the great-grandparent. The future is now. It's not a horizontal arrow into the future, considering what this country will be like in 200 years but it is a vertical growth of generations, a multiplication of generations across a consistent and identical time period. 
It is a growth within the life cycle of the parent who is demanding a better future. In such a way, the time consideration of the parent is identical to the time consideration of those without children. To consider the world of your grandchildren is to inhabit also the world of your grandchildren. You will still be alive when your grandchildren are alive, and so you benefit directly and indirectly from any policy that you claim is on the behalf of them. Spending on children, then, is not spending for the benefit of the planet as a whole, or some abstract national progeny, or even for the welfare of the parents' own children, but for the immediate redistribution of spending to members of their family. Again, this must be asserted that concern for the future generations is not a concern for future spending, but a concern for the distribution of present spending. Intergenerational spending is not intertemporal, as the great grandparent is voting on the relative distribution of state benefits and taxes across coexistent generations. This occurs across all generations simultaneously. When the elderly vote for student tuition fee increases, but a triple lock on their pensions, it is not described as a past-oriented policy, as backward-thinking intertemporal choice. It is described in terms of intergenerational distribution. Equally, parents voting to increase government spending on their children is not a future-oriented policy or a forward-thinking intertemporal choice, but an intergenerational policy to redistribute government spending to benefit their own children. Parents claim to want a better life for the children, but what they really demand is a better life for their children. And that better life can be guaranteed by an increase of the distribution of taxation to their own children now. It does not necessitate the increase of spending in the future or of relinquishing short-term gains for long-term policy outcomes. If they had skin in the game when it came to the future, then when it came to, for instance, climate change, we would expect parents to reduce their children's consumption reduce the number of summer holidays their children have, to withdraw them from distant private boarding schools and enrol them in local schools, to allow their children to walk to school rather than being driven, to lower household consumption, reducing the utility of their children and themselves, to not go off to Val Turen for a ski holiday, to not show them the Great Wall of China, and to not show them the pyramids. But do parents do this? No, they do not. Parents do none of these things. Why? Because when they demand a better life for future generations, they are demanding a better life now for their children. This concern for future generations cannot be conflated with a concern for the future. There are so many cases, too innumerable to enumerate, where parents' short-term immediate concerns conflict with long-run prosperity and the health of the whole population. One controversial and unpopular example is immigration. In the long run, GDP growth is essentially reducible to population growth and productivity growth. Krugman goes as far to say that productivity growth is the only game in town, but we know that both are important in their relative ways. The UK has been in productivity stagnation, and so GDP growth stagnation, for two main reasons. The first is the slow diffusion of productivity gains, and, record, and the second is record low interest rates. In the first case, only a small number of UK firms are actually becoming more productive. The top 5% of firms are driving all the growth, the Amazons and Googles of the world. These firms are innovating in technology, big data, global supply chain, and are often export-oriented. 
because these firms are so plugged into the global supply chain and they're so concerned with innovations of scale, those innovations do not quickly diffuse to the smaller companies. While this is fantastic for the top firms, mainly centred around London, that innovation and productivity does not diffuse to the 95% of small S the SME businesses. Most SMEs simply don't have the capital to replicate scale given productivity. And the tech unicorns of you know, the SaaS world often have their innovations pinched by larger companies through partnerships or acquisitions. Indeed, this is the case for major banks, such as JP Morgan, Barclays and others, that their strategy of innovation is to allow smaller firms to develop and then to accumulate them and absorb them into their large umbrella by acquiring them for large amounts of money. So these large companies like Google, which we imagined Google to be this huge innovation tech giant, or we imagined perhaps even a big bank to be an innovation tech giant in the modern world, they are not. Their strategy is to allow smaller tech companies to innovate and then to use their large accumulation of capital to bring that technology in-house. So there is a great sucking sound of innovation and capital into fewer and fewer hands. While SaaS firms exist to provide smaller firms access to productivity boosting technology, this process is still slow and there's a considerable lag between top end productivity growth and the diffusion down to less productive firms. So that's the first reason that we have low productivity. And of course it is low productivity that is part of the justification for immigration. The second issue is that interest rates have been kept so low for so long that there are many unproductive firms that are massively over leveraged and unproductive. These firms that are unproductive and only surviving on low interest debt are called the quote zombie companies which you may have heard in the news and they've doubtlessly exploded since the Covid pandemic and the QE business loan response. Much of this debt and much of the QE is simply written off and much of it has been written off already. And the banks are furious about having to be forced to collect the loans that have been extended to those businesses on behalf of the government. If rates were to rise, interest rates, many of these low productivity, high leverage firms would go bust and its workers would become unemployed. But rising rates could also increase productivity growth by a few percentage points, despite causing mass unemployment. Central banks are generally apolitical and have the primary goal of controlling inflation, the rising cost of goods. The Bank of England, since Blair's gift of independence, has the primary goal of maintaining 2% inflation, which it has achieved. And this is a great success of stable monetary policy. And the more stability that a government and a monetary authority has, the lower the interest rates on the loans that the government can take. But the Bank of England also has a secondary goal of supporting the health of the economy. With inflation being so structurally low for so long, low rates could be happily maintained for almost a decade. The Bank of England are not going to make the political decision to correct rates upwards to improve productivity because of the high levels of unemployment that it would cause. They do not view the few points of productivity growth in the long run as being worth the short term unemployment. So now we've addressed this productivity crisis, you might be thinking, how is this relevant to the childless? <laughs> But, of course, what we're trying to prove is that simply having a child does not mean that you are concerned with the long-term interests of the country. So with low productivity, since we've established that the long-term increases in GDP are reducible to population growth and productivity growth, in the long run, with low productivity growth, which is unwilling to be resolved by governments for the reasons I've already explained, 
the dislocation of asset prices from actual values, so-called the everything bubble, and the increase in the population in the economy are the determinants of GDP growth. More people means more consumers, more workers, more entrepreneurs. The native populations are quivering around the replacement rate. And so, when these workers also and these firms have low productivity, what else can the government do than accept large numbers of skilled and unskilled workers to make up the population shortfall? In London alone, the population has entirely changed, to the point where London is a truly international city, as were Alexandria, Rome or Baghdad. The middle, Rome, was founded by bandits, immigrants, smugglers, refugees and exiles. But despite justifying London's nationalism through ancient examples, as the now Prime Minister Boris Johnson once did, the celebration of this transition and this sudden demographic shift is an instance of short-termism, obliterating any long-term consequences. The future effect of large demographic changes was and is not a serious consideration. It's hand waved away as being non-existent, a concern motivated by racism that would be solved by integration, by multiculturalism. Oh, um, uh, no, of course not, but uh, 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 of all people coming together under one polity or um, uh, the respectful integration of differences, um, even though that might be contradictory. There is no serious policy response to this. There has always been immigration and integration, and there has always been a populist reaction to it. In the examples of Baghdad, Alexandria and Rome, immigration has not necessarily been a bad thing. Before the time of the Caesars, the population of Rome was 40% non-Roman residents. Those were the workers, the merchants, the investors, the entrepreneurs, the bandits and the refugees, indeed. But those were the people that would form the Imperium. And Boris Johnson particularly, our Prime Minister, holds that view that from Athens to Rome, both these cities have been multicultural and both of these cities have thrived. But we exist in a totally different circumstance. In the Roman society, there was the social war on the Italian peninsula between the Italian residents of Rome that did not have citizenship and the Romans that did. The true fact of the matter is that when you increase diversity, you increase social fragmentation. And social fragmentation is deleterious to economic outcomes. So it's true that despite that always being immigration, always being integration, always being populist reaction, that the world keeps on spinning. It's true on the whole. But there's a wide and orthodox literature on the negative effects of ethnic fractionalization. Ethnically heterogeneous populations have a lower support for public provision of goods and universal welfare programs, with higher support for patronage welfare programs that target their own group. The more fractionalised regions have higher local government debt despite receiving more central funding than homogenous areas. Alessina argues that this increase in central funding is to offset the disaster of the local funding structure. These areas of ethnic fractionalisation have a lower willingness to pay taxes. A low willingness to pay is not simply racist majorities not wanting money to go to minorities. It is also minority communities who believe that the government will be majoritarian and use the taxes to spend proportionally more on programmes that benefit the majority group. All ethnic groups fight their own corner, and the more groups there are, the lower the desire for a universalised public system. These types of fractionalization effects are either completely dismissed as too insignificant to explore or accepted as the price we pay to live in a forward-looking society. And these concerns are seen as so esoteric and distant that most people simply don't care. 
Our short-term consumption of polluting resources has had huge seen and unforeseen consequences. And similarly, the demographic transition, which has immediate short-term benefits, will have seen and unforeseen consequences, many of which are, on the whole, negative or problems to be dealt with in the distant future. Immigration will never be limited, because it is fantastic in the short term, causing higher population growth, GDP growth, higher firm cultural diversity, which increases productivity, more house buyers, more consumers, and a healthy supply of skilled workers who are educated by another government but pay tax to our own. Meta-analysis on immigration shows that wages may fall by a statistically significant amount, but a quantitatively minute amount. So minute that any depression in wages is offset by the value of in-kind government transfers paid by the immigrants themselves. And yet, despite the long-term consequences and the short-term gain, where we would expect the parents of children to be thinking about the long-term in 100 or 200 years' time, parents will demand massive amounts of low-skilled immigration, without any concern for the long-term effects of fractionalization. It will be demanded so that immigrants can do the grubby jobs that are, quote, beneath the aspirations of their children who will of course be going to university. This is the meme of immigrants doing the jobs we don't want our kids to do. Do we really want our children picking vegetables? Or working as cleaners? Or Amazon warehouse workers? Good heavens, no, no! Not for my little Olivia, no! It will be very interesting to see the 2021 census, and it may indeed be the last census in its traditional form. The demographic shift will be immense and I expect many people will not be happy about it. But what do we mean when we talk about the future? When we talk about parents that care about their children? We're talking really about the present. From issues such as long-term productivity, to immigration, to climate change, these parents of children do not care and if they did care, it would be revealed by their actions. What happens when people have children is that they care more about the redistribution of your wealth to their children. That is the concern. It's not the concern of what this country will be like in 50 years, or 100 years, or 250 years. It is a concern of how the resources of the state can be distributed immediately to their own children. We know when people have children, they demand more money for education, more money for child benefit, and more money for themselves. So having children does not mean that you have skin in the game for the future. Indeed, it is very often the childless leader that has more of a concern for the future because they do not have these biases towards immediate distribution. So indeed, in some ways, not having a child is better than having a child in terms of your skin in the game for the future. Because once you have a child, you will demand more distribution of other people's taxes and other people's money into providing for your own child. So the conclusion is that having a child can either be irrelevant or deleterious to the benefit of the country that you inhabit. It does not necessarily mean that you have a better stake in the country. It does not necessarily mean that you have greater foresight than those that do not have children. And it does not necessarily mean that your opinion should be respected more than others. That to simply have a child does not give you the right does not give you the privilege to decide the future of the country because they are not concerned about the future they are concerned about the present they are concerned about the distribution of money to their own children right now